this 30 year old journey that we've undertaken both professionally and otherwise and what the nation has undertaken just love to hear your thoughts on it well i mean to begin with one recalls the date december 6 1992 around 1:30 in the afternoon <laughs> we were i must say in retrospect a little uh, not quite on the uh, ball we were having a relaxed sunday till suddenly around 1:30 i got a call from uh, sajid rashid our dear friend who is no longer uh, with us to say the babri masjid has been demolished the first dome has been demolished and we were completely shocked and horrified by that <coughs> and uh, i mean quite clearly that day marked the opening of the flood gates flood gates of a politics it was both a point of arrival for the uh, hindutva politics and also a point of departure that from there on it has been a kind of a uh, virtually a downhill most of the time till we have arrived where we are today that's, that's actually uh, very well put i remember watching it on uh, doordarshan uh, which was the only uh, uh, it, uh, was showing some uh, other stuff not not showing the demolition but we saw it on the bbc and uh, the the uh, other point i just wanted to make is that from 3:30 pm that afternoon of course i was out in the streets and uh, all over mumbai on the streets bombay then but you said it was both a point of arrival and a point of departure uh, i mean i mean I, i i've written about i've spoken about how the uh, for, for me at least it was like the, like a very open uh, challenge to the indian state challenge that was first issued i think with the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi ji on 30th of January uh, to basically signal a, a complete discomfort with uh, the the uh, the path that India had adopted despite uh, the bloody uh, bloodiness of partition despite the fact that a neighbor neighboring country had been formed on the basis of religion India in its wisdom decided to opt to stay a constitutional secular socialist democratic republic and the assassination of gandhi ji on 30th january in my view has always been the first declaration of intent of the forces that are very uncomfortable with this reality of india and then you see the demolition itself on 6th of december in pub- full public view with 3000 uh, law enforcement officials just watching uh, so you said it's been a downhill trend were there any respites in between do you think were there any respites or positive things that happened and emerged out of this event are we talking about 92 onwards or we talk about uh, from where years, we began 30 years 30 years uh, 30 years actually i'd like to go back a little bit to the uh, time of the uh, framing of the indian constitution itself which from what i recall baba sahab ambedkar uh, at some point saying that it's like a nurturing a small it's a small plant that needs nurturing that seeds for which have been laid <laughs> and it is that nurt- it is a plant that required nurturing that could could not be taken for granted as a full grown tree <laughs> and uh, i think the indian state and society were on the one hand i mean there was a, despite the bloody partition there were the stalwarts of uh, of the kind of uh, gandhi ji of nehru of molana azad of sardar patel etc etc and many many others of course who were committed to a secular democratic india which is kind of uh, enshrined in its constitution but they were also within this secular party itself as we know i mean from day one <laughs> that it was a mixture it, it it contained within itself many very many members who thought otherwise i mean they were not members of the rss or the hindu mahasabha necessary some were in fact even in, from the hindu mahasabha that the kind of uh, sharp separation between uh, secular politics and a religion based politics that we saw in europe which led to the emergence of a secular state we we did not see a similar kind of a sharp uh, divide here between those who were clearly committed to secular democratic values and those who were not i mean i think it was soon after the uh, assassination of mahatma gandhi itself not long after that when uh, godse was to be not godse uh, 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 guru golwalkar was to be arrested in up if, if i remember right and the then chief minister of up kind of connived to ensure that he got away with it so there were there, there were bright moments of course there were the celebration of uh, ganga jamuni uh, uh, tehzeeb 
but at the same time as we progress over time and especially from the 60s onwards when we saw riots breaking out in one state after another one city after another till we come to the early 80s onwards where we are no longer talking about just riots we are talking about pogroms the targeting of a particular community whether it was community whether it was muslims that often whether it was six on the, in 1984 whether it was kandamal christians and uh, this thing where the indian state was found wanting as it was found wanting on the, the december 6 1992 itself what was the prime minister doing what happened wasn't the supreme court aware of what was going on i mean the writing was well on the wall <clears throat> but the state did not kind of uh, take the kind of a stand that it should have taken at the same time civil society organizations i remember for example the friend uh, and historian dilip simian saying that had there been a counter mobilization at that time the left party was strong enough had there been one lakh counter mobilization of the left parties forget the congress party and the rest of it that could have been kind of a, a posed a challenge and the issue could have been settled perhaps quite differently but it did not happen and those compromises kept on getting made and uh, ultimately we've landed where we are you know i just have a little issue with what you said about the making of the constitution uh, because the way it's been framed it appears to me as if it was just a few stalwarts who decided that this wonderful document should come into being and i've always believed that right from the time of buddha basavanna kabir uh you know tukara mahadev eknat you've had a phule you've had a very strong questioning of structural inequality and the hierarchy of caste in this country which has always talked about the politics of emancipation and and demanded equality and dignity for large sections of our people and similarly under colonial rule when you had large sections of our adivasi and the agrarian class challenging the economic uh, uh, oppression of the of the colonial rulers which was markedly different from the medieval period where you had uh, rulers who lived in india and kept the uh, kept capital uh, accumulated capital within the country you had uh, you had a large indian people's consciousness that was also moving towards emancipatory notions that had always been demanding emancipatory notions of dignity equality for gender i mean basavanna threw away his i mean you're talking about 12th century ad he took threw away his janoi and said that i believe that you know gender and caste are the two uh, markers of inequality in this country in in this land so i think the fact that the constitution became the document it did with all its limitations and flaws also was a response to the national movement in the immediate but also the centuries old demand mm-hmm. for a uh, 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 situation at least a dream of equality and non discrimination because i think otherwise you have these uh, ultra right forces who always say that these are foreign notions they are not constitutional values that are against indian culture but actually what is indian culture indian people and the a section of indian people have always demanded dignity and non discrimination it's just that their history has not been written in full it's still a work in progress so i think I'm, i for me it's not insignificant that december 6 was chosen for the day of the demolition because it is the mahan nirman divas of baba saheb ambedkar it's a it's a it's a day which is very very important to the vast dalit and subaltern uh, communities in this country today at shivaji park in bombay you have large like you have, you have the newspapers uh, including uh, uh, full of advertisements given by of course the parties that believe in a hindutva regime so i think it's also the fact that the, the values of parity and non discrimination which people abided by by and large articulated themselves into a document when a state was to come into being well i don't really disagree with you i'm just talking about the glass being half half full on the one hand there were these kind of strong emancipatory kind of uh, voices and, and uh, efforts and initiatives with which a large section of indian society participated on the other hand you still had manuvad and brahmanism you know and the uh, uh, all that it represented in terms of politics culture and the rest of it i uh, let me just give you one or two examples from outside the uh, india to illustrate what i mean by the t- 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 taking communal forces head on for example in 1993 in england a young teenager stephen lawrence was kind of killed Uh, as a result of by some uh, white supremacists the matter went to trial and the they were acquitted 
Stephen Lawrence's mother cried out that she has not got justice and she wants justice and she will not keep quiet till justice was uh, kind of delivered. In 1998, when the issue was still kind of kept alive, kept alive by uh, human rights groups, by uh, other or similar uh, kind of rights organizations, liberties organizations, when the Sir William McPherson report, uh, in, uh, public inquiry was committed, uh, was appointed, which ruled uh, came out with the report a year later saying there's institutionalized racism within the british police force jack straw who was the home secretary said that appointing this committee was the most important thing in his he had done in his tenure there were hate crime manuals created for the police force where it was clearly stated that this, we are talking about one 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 person being killed Every life is precious, but we are talking about one person uh, uh, being created. But look at what happened in response to that to Sir McPherson report and the actions that were taken. I'm not saying Britain is a uh, paradise to today, far from it. But uh, in terms of the kind of responses it can trigger within society, you com compare and contrast that with 1983, Delhi massacre, what happened, Bhagalpur, what happened, De Delhi, what happened to Sikhs, Bombay, what happened to this thing. And what this state response here has been. In 2001, January in Norway, for the first time in the history of Norway at that time, a, a black person was again killed by two uh, white youths. The very next day, there was a huge demonstration in Oslo, the capital of, the, uh, of Norway, which was led by none less than the prime minister of that country, who said, this is not our way, we shall not tolerate hate crimes in this country. Concerts were organized across the, 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 the city in solidarity and support and things like that. More closer to our time, we can talk about 2019 March in Christchurch bombing in a mosque in New Zealand. And we all remember it's only of recent origin of the kind of response that we got from the Prime Minister of New, New, New Zealand. The kind of gestures and uh, symbolism that she adopted to kind of send out a message to society. I'm saying that kind of a thing we've not seen here. We've seen the, 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 the. So what you're talking about is an absence of institutional memory, because I believe that right from the first uh, riot report that I read, the Jabalpur report and the Ranchi report, the Telicheri report, the Jagmohan Reddy, uh, Jagmohan, uh, Reddy report, the Ahmedabad 1969 report. This is before you come to the pro program stage. Even the 60s and 70s when you had communal violence and You're right. communal. Two phenomenons were evident. One is of noticeable, if not majority, but noticeable, even the Madan Commission is actually a seminal report of 1975, uh, when, when the Bivandi Bombay violence happened, that you see the noticeable partisan behavior in echelons of the police, number one, and you see the role of hate speech and hate writing for weeks and months before the first stone is cast, and then the failure to prosecute the hate speech and hate violence thereafter. Even our jurisprudence on that question has grown slowly. First time that the Bombay High Court took cognizance of election petitions was in the 1980s. And then the Supreme Court, unfortunately, turned some of those down. But more recently, we've had since 2014 and 18, we've had some uh, seminal judgments like the Pravasi Bhalai Sangatan judgment, which actually locates hate speech as a form of discrimination, stigmatization and marginalization. But none of these observations, either by the Judicial Commission reports, nor by the Supreme Court, filter down to the ground. Does, it does not really affect either the way state and regional governments behave or the way the police force behaves. So this absence of institutional memory is what I call it. Who is responsible for that? Is it the media? Is it the courts? Is it the government? Is it the elected representative? Is it an absent civil society? You you use the term uh, institutional memory. Uh, I would use the term kind of for the state's tolerance of intolerance. I would use the word to talk about the in intent of the state, the state institutions and the people who occupy it. Are ultimately, I mean, these institutions, whether it's the courts or the judici judiciary, legislature, executive, whatever it is, uh, is people by, uh, it's populated by people, by individual hum human beings. And what we see from Time after time after time, you you were right that even before the programs kind of started, the none of these reports were ever acted upon. I mean, which is where it stands out in kind of screaming contrast to the Lord McPherson report at that time in terms of some fallout it had. Not 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 that uh, I repeat one one more time that not that the UK is uh, heaven today, but still there was a certain kind of response, and I think it grew out of the 
kind of uh, process, historical process through which secularism and the secular state was born in the West. We have not had a similar this thing that the plant that was uh, planted in 1949 and uh, adopted in 1950 as the Constitution of India needed the kind of nurturing by the state. The, con the Constitution kind of abolished untouchability, but we are still living in untouchability. The Constitution talks about in the fundamental rights section about No, but the equality. Constitution, uh, the Baba Sahib wanted to actually abolish caste, but he was not successful with that. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, uh, I mean, if you can talk about abolition of caste as a process also, where is that process that we see? We Today, still temple ent entry is an issue. We talk about gender justice, the right of women to enter a temple or a mosque is an issue. So, so whether it's a question of gender, whether it's a question of caste, whether it's a question of equality, the constitution, we have one of the finest constitutions in the world, but the people who kind of are uh, sworn to kind of protect and promote that constitution, they have been founding, found wanting again and again, had just like we often say, you know, in the context, uh, context of our dis various discourses that had the guilty of 1984 been punished, 1992 would have not have happened. At the guilty of 1992, Bombay, we were talking about it was Bombay, then it's Mumbai now. Uh, 2002, Gujarat would not have happened. Similarly, had nine, December 6, 1992, the Babri Masjid demolition been stopped by the Indian state. And by, by, by that, I refer to both the Prime Minister of India, the then Government of India, and also the Supreme Court. Perhaps we would, I mean, it, it might have been a bitter struggle or whatever it is, but, but the end result of that might have been something different. Whereas the floodgates got opened and we, we could not stop it. The Indian state did not intervene to the, in the way fashion that it should have. The floodgates got opened. What was until then politically incorrect became kind of, I mean, in Mumbai, the elite circles, the, the, you, you remember, we heard jokes at that time. The only good Muslim is a dead Muslim, etc., etc. So it came all, 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 all those, those years of that. That's why I'm saying that it was both a point of... Uh, arrival and a point of departure for Hindutva politics, December 6, 1992. I think like I would like to also talk a little bit about society apart from the state because I think that's also important. And we started, I mean, our initiative at that point, August 1993, was the launching of Communalism Combat, five years as a tabloid, then as a monthly uh, magazine. Uh, and of course, I remember the uh, About Us that we wrote together where we were very clear that the whole issue of uh, majority communalism and minority communalism had to be dealt with, uh, if not in this, uh, with the same uh, uh, intensity, but at least with the same uh, sincerity and acumen. So I just would like to also talk a little bit about society and the shift that we've seen within Indian society, of course, in terms of where the majority is, but also in terms of where the minority is. Uh, I'm not quite clear what you are. Uh, uh, in the sense, I think there's a greater acceptance in the majority community, at least the vocal section, to live with the kind of very polarized language of hate discourse in this country, which, as you yourself said, has been legitimized. And I still do not believe that the majority uh, uh, buys into that discourse. But for whatever reason, the rest are happy to be quiet or happy to be compliant and silent. And therefore, the, the, uh, the, the uh, prevalent impression, whether it's during election time or non-election time, in any case with this regime, it looks, it's perpetually on election mode. It's, uh, it's like at all times, and particularly with the new phenomenon of social media, which is like in the face, in your life, 24-7, there seems to be an acceptance of a certain section being able to live with this aggression and violence and this hate. Yeah. Uh, this has... I mean, seminally impacted the minorities as, as it has to and must, just as December 6, 1992 has. Muslims, of course, but also Christians and other minorities. Because I mean, at the end of the day, what are you talking about when you talk Indian culture, Indian faith? Are you talking about just one or are you talking about multiple? So I'm just saying, what, how, how has society been impacted by this? Well, one example that immediately comes to mind is that uh, speaking from very per personal experience of yours and mine, just recently, our uh, nephew uh, uh, and my young, youngest sister were married to each other, were there in Mumbai. They had come from Allahabad for treatment of their uh, son. And before this, they had been uh, in ICU in several hospitals in Allahabad for several days 
the son was uh, b- b- badly hit by diabetes and all fortunately is feeling okay now but i remember he was very clearly, serious he was very ha, serious very serious and i remember quite clearly that the first thing that the my uh, the, the sister uh, the, uh, our sister shahana said was ki inside the hospital we never felt that we were hindus and muslims i mean the, the nurses were hindu the doctors were hindu the ward boys were hindu everybody is hindu and everybody is full of con- concern and empathy and wo- saying don't worry giving dilasa giving uh, kind of uh, uh, assurance don't worry everything will be all right and she said it almost looks like we live in two different worlds that there is a world of the godi media the uh, uh, lab dog media if you like in english if you look at that if you look at the statements of bjp leaders from the up chief minister to the home minister to the prime minister whoever it is it looks like this society is torn apart and every day we do hear i mean t- terrible kind of uh, examples of what is happening but if you also remember that we've heard this in the context of riot situations of people who wanted peace and the this thing was ke hum to shanti chahte hain magar jab 1000 ka mob jo hai to samne aa jata hai aur uske hath mein talwar hai aur ye hai aur danda hai aur kya kya hai aur police khamoshi khamoshi sab dekh rahi hai to what can we possibly do we don't like this but there's little we can do to stop it so even in the middle of all the hate and the this and there is you still have examples in uh, mumbai for example uh, where ganesh chaturthi is uh, the, the celebrated jointly by hindus and muslims not all muslims not all hindus but th- there are enough armed uh, muslims and armed hindus who do this or we can talk about west bengal uh, and the uh, durga puja so i i agree with you and i do believe that a large part of indian society is still kind of peace loving it is in the interest of the peace lovers do not make noise it is the head mongers who make all the noise it, it, it is the mobs who commit the violence it is not the ones who don't want the violence they i mean it takes enormous amount of courage for on the part of one individual and we have examples of that as well through the history of communal violence where one individual uh, woman or one individual man stands up and there is a whole mob to uh, uh, <coughs> kind of uh, uh, stop their violence in in the early years post independence jawaharlal nehru would kind of just b- b- walk into a kind of a mob and start shouting and screaming pc joshi in pune used to do the same thing we don't hear that so that that, that challenge is not there to in our, in our kurla i remember it was raman one tripat that elderly congress old congressman right. who, who used to actually sit on the charpai when there was tension and violence to ensure that the mobs don't come out tripati ji tripati i remember that yeah So you feel is there a failure in the moral uh, fiber of the political class? I I I I think so. I I would not blame the armed the ordinary people so easily. And we also have examples of galore. Many of these examples, for example, that have been shared with the that we both in a Ryan Rai, former IPS officer, fine officer, who has shared with us, <laughs> where. Uh, 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 the when the police when the police has been quite quite clear about its role uh, the mobs have also kind of melted away is it 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 is the silent this thing of the police the complicity of the police that the various judicial commissions of inquiry have pointed out that emboldens the kind of uh, trouble makers the killers the murderers the rapists or whatever it is <laughs> and the those who pre- pre- prefer peace i mean feel completely outnumbered and helpless it takes rare courage, courage uh, I, i repeat and as you also said for some individuals to stand out and kind of challenge the mobs so i hold the state responsible i hold the state responsible to call it the moral fiber of the people who are there so what ahead i mean what 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 do you see ahead this is a 30 year marker that we've been discussing uh, and uh, 6 december 2022 today so what do you see ahead as to what should i mean what i mean we know the structure and the content of the indian state today so maybe there's no hope from the party in power at the moment but but what lies ahead i mean what are the steps what do you see ahead well in, in times such as these it look like quite dark <laughs> times uh, difficult to kind of uh, think of what lies ahead but point is this cannot carry on no society can carry on like this so something has to give somewhere people uh, i don't do not believe that everybody who votes for a certain party and for majoritarian politics or whatever it is are necessarily doing it 
for all the reasons that the that majority in politics stands for maybe they enamored of an ind individual who seems like a uh superhero who will solve everybody's problems and so on <clears throat> but at some point people are going to be disappointed and why talk about some point in the future i mean talk about today talk about tamil nadu talk about kerala talk about uh, uh west bengal talk about bihar <clears throat> talk about possibly maharashtra in the next election punjab so, so, <clears throat> punjab if all our society is so kind of uh, uh, Conflict on how do we explain these kind of states? Bihar, Bihar is a great example. <clears throat> that the same Bihar where I mean, one day when uh, the, the certain kind of political alliances and power something happens, the other day I mean, the, the, everything seems to change overnight. So how come mass psychology can change overnight? It's it's the political process that changes uh, overnight. The games that politicians play, I I would say that uh, we need to be looking at, and uh, hopefully. Uh, ordinary people ordinary citizens <clears throat> i mean organizations civil society like uh, uh, organizations such as ours will continue to do what we do <clears throat> but uh, i think the great responsibility lies on the political class because ultimately the kind of uh, majoritarian politics and the kind of fascistic tendencies it kind of uh, uh, holds within itself cannot just be fought by civil society organizations however many, many they might be and however laudable their initiatives are <clears throat> I think we should also add Kerala and Delhi to that list because Delhi has had a uh, election course, both at the state and at the MCD level where there has been an opposition party which has come to power. And India is not just about majoritarian politics. I mean, you have the whole vast su southern uh, uh, states which are culturally very very rich, uh, culturally a challenge to majoritarianism like maybe others are not, like maybe the West is not. So I think we also need to keep reiterating. that what is india what is indian culture which is the ma major religion what is the form of that religion because i mean this wonderful uh, ramanujan's book of 300 ramayans i think really typifies what the society is really about that yes of course you have uh, a much loved god and uh, uh, the ramayan but there are several versions of it and i think that is the beauty of the kind of culture we 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 have uh, at least grown up with if we don't see it even if we don't see it that vibrantly in western india today yeah and we need to keep reiterating the fact that you pointed out uh, the, the, right in the beginning that the constitution of india is not just the, the indian constitution is not a western import it resonates well with the history and culture of of this very rich uh, culture of this country uh, and uh, it is a question of reviving the that celebrating that in a way that should have been done from 1947 onwards which we did not do too many concessions were made not only to hindu communalism but also to muslim communalism <clears throat> and uh, that doesn't help matters either the communalism of different kinds kind of feed each other communalism is, is not just an indian problem is a subcontinental problem if you rem remember the uh, immediate response was, there was a sense of shock and dismay in indian society when the uh, on 6 december 1992 till the bbc started showing television uh, images of uh, idols being broken in pakistan and bangladesh and over and bangladesh overnight the kind of uh, <coughs> this thing changed otherwise even uh, 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 lal krishna adwani was compelled to say that this is the darkest night of his uh, career uh, life or something like that uh, despite the fact that he had get on of course yeah of course yeah we saw the kind of uh, extremely cleverly crafted yatra and we saw the violence uh, before and after in its wake we also saw it was never really about uh, the building of a uh, temple to a beloved god but actually to assert discriminatory citizenship of a large section of indians and that is what unfortunately december 6 uh, comes to mean for many of us but i think it also means a lot of things uh, to a large section of the indian population which is right now at chaitya bhumi and uh, actually celebrating the life of an amazing uh, i mean i i, I mean, how do you describe a man like baba saheb ambedkar with his vision uh, with his uh, erudite skills uh, i mean he was both an e economist historian constitutionalist writer lawyer and i think there's a large section of indians actually celebrating him on december 6 today right now as we speak so i think uh, this is what india is it's not simply about supremacy and majoritarianism it's also about voices that have not been heard 
so we should we, we should we should therefore uh, the, remember this day as baba saheb ambedkar's day and his Much contribution well. yeah. his contribution to the constitution of india and uh, our obligation to kind of live up to those constitutional values <coughs> at individual level the society level the, the state level and that is where the way lies forward yeah and also always remember that uh, the the uh, we, not only we should we remember him and all that but also recall his writings because i think recall his thoughts and writings on the nature of the state on the nature of uh, parliamentary democracy on the nature of what he felt about not just the muslim league but also about hindu rashtra i think all of these are very very important because he was pretty even handed when he spoke about all these things apart from speaking about dalit land rights and emancipation of women and of course uh, annihilation of caste uh javed it's been a very very rich uh, and also painful uh, personal and professional journey with you and uh, i think because we are coming to about half an hour plus it's time to sort of wrap up this conversation sure, i don't you. know whether you want to talk about a few few minutes about communism combat or you want to just sum up and say something else and then i'll just wind up no i think we we'll leave it at this we we'll leave it at this yeah just to just to repeat in one sentence that uh, if we are fighting communalism uh, majoritarianism we are fighting majoritarianism but we are also fighting communal politics and when we are fighting communal politics no concession should be made to communal politics of any hue communalism of any hue that that is something that we've always believed in we've always kind of said and we need to keep re- re- reiterating that because the two communalisms or different communalism feed each other provide fodder to each other So, so thank you so thank you friends for being with us on this uh, live uh, informal discussion uh, i i keep typifying what javed just said with two examples of two cover stories we did in august 19 uh, i think it was august 1998 and november 1998 uh, uh, august 98 uh, was or october 98 i'm not sure it was welcome to hindu rashtra when we was tracking the kind of polarization of society within the state of gujarat and in november was hell on earth when uh, communism combat by the way was the first magazine in south asia to spotlight the horrors of the taliban long before the bamiyan buddhas long before that we talked to an extremely brave organization called the revolutionary association of afghan women and we focused on what's happening in our neighboring state of afghanistan that has rich cultural and historical ties with our country i still remember stories of kabuliwala when we were growing up and i think therefore we need to understand that the phenomenons we are talking about whether it's in pakistan afghanistan sri lanka myanmar or bangladesh or india have a resonance and a recall for all of us been a difficult few years is probably going to be a difficult few more years but we have to live in hope and hope that the tide will soon turn let's remember as david said december 6 as mahan nirman day baba saheb ambedkar's day and not as the day shameful day for the demolition of the babri masjid thanks everybody for watching